A man simply known as the Butcher returns to Paris seeking work after he brutally assaults his pregnant partner, a man filled with resentment, hatred and misanthropy, often stuck within swirling internal monologues of bigotry and bile towards people who refuse him work and money. The one aspect of his life he doesn't feel was a complete mistake is his own daughter. This is Gaspar Noé's I Stand Alone, known in French as Sous Contre Tout, which translates to Alone Against Everyone, a comment on the film's agonising reflection that everybody is alone during life, death and sex. A continuation of Noé's Carne, a short film, its events briefly revisited via a montage of still images and voiceover early on. Noé's distinct, neon-drenched visual aesthetic, akin to climax, love and enter the void, is not present here. I Stand Alone is a much grimier, squalid film, demonstrating a vicious sense of misanthropy towards the wider world encouraged by deteriorating economic opportunities, intense poverty and struggling mental health. Discussing I Stand Alone for the New York Times, Stephen Holden wrote that I Stand Alone probes as relentlessly into the psychology of nihilism as any movie has ever attempted. It uses the most extreme images and jarring sound effects to brand its characters searing message onto our brains, whether we like it or not. Those devices include the use of amplified gunshots to demarcate scenes, unblinking close-up images of shuddering violence violence, a swatch of hardcore pornography and a continual torrent of hateful epithets directed at almost everybody but especially at those suspected of being homosexual. As Stephen Holden suggests, to watch I Stand Alone is to be branded with the protagonist's brutal message of misanthropy. Each gunshot sound effect rattles and jars the viewer, forcing them to acknowledge the image on the screen. The prejudice of the protagonist, the butcher, exaggerates and cements his disdain for humanity. Why would this man respect another human being if he views humanity so lowly. The Butcher isn't intended as a character to admire, he is homophobic, misogynistic, ableist and racist. The Butcher is a miserable man who places the blame on everyone else for his own misfortune, for his own malicious actions and for his own dwindling mental health. In a poverty stricken community with zero opportunities for work, at least for the Butcher, a community where nobody has any spare cash, especially the business owners struggling with their own bankruptcies and monetary issues. The Butcher is made to walk between points where he faces the difficulty of rejection. The Butcher is resentful because of his experiences with rejection and yet his resentment, bubbling and increasing with each obstacle, is also likely an element which holds him back from reaching any actual achievement. It is a vicious cycle of rejection, hate, hate, rejection. His hatred delves into anti-natalist and nihilistic thought, something which is reinforced by the film's own intertitles stating that living is a selfish act, surviving is a genetic law. Within I Stand Alone's own textual discussion, living is a selfish act, therefore it must also be selfish to bring life into the world of the living. Birthing by logic is also a selfish act. This is a philosophy reinforced in Thomas Ligotti's The Conspiracy Against the Human Race, a book containing a series of essays exploring the writer's own antinatalist and pessimistic views of human existence. This is the mindset that I Stand Alone is exploring with its character to the Butcher, a man whose internal monologue suggests that children wish to be beaten so they have a reason to place their parents into awful care homes. Following the misanthropic perspective, isn't it selfish that the Butcher, a man who causes excessive damage via violent threats and abuse to other people, continues to exist within the world? It's a perspective that comes full circle as the Butcher speculates killing people he believes to have wronged him before he speculates about shooting himself. This speculation of suicidal ideation is explored thoroughly during a sequence where the Butcher collects his mute daughter, a patient in a psychiatric hospital, bringing her back to his apartment, the room in which she was conceived, and fantasises about killing her, life and death within the same location, fantasising about her bleeding out, struggling to die, causes the Butcher's internal monologue to clash, overlap and conflict, as he mentally encourages and deters himself to put her out of her misery before shooting himself. Flashes of sexual images images, images of the conceiving of his daughter, intermingle with images of his own suicide during this fantasising sequence. He is overwhelmed by the pressures of life and death, the responsibility of giving life and the consequences of taking it away. This sequence becomes a sensory overload, a stressful viewing experience, especially for those who have struggled with thoughts of suicide ideation, but it captures I Stand Alone's misanthropic and antinatalist perspective effectively. If the butcher is to bring a life into a world of suffering, 
suffering, then he is doing a favour in taking the suffering away. Of course, this sequence is a fantasy. Within the world of reality, the Butcher establishes an incestuous relationship with his daughter, and while his resentments for the world remain, his reconnection with his daughter offers him a glimmer of hope within a brutal world. Our disgust at his action only aids in reinforcing his perspective that the world is unaccepting of people such as him. Is this a redemption arc of some sort, perhaps? Stephen Holden suggests so, stating later in his review that, as surges of tenderness and self-pity mingle with his vivid fantasies of incest, murder and suicide, the movie offers the tiniest glimmer of redemption. This is the tiniest glimmer of redemption because to the wider world this isn't a redemption at all, but spiralling further down the butcher's rabbit hole of transgressive behaviour. But within the world of I Stand Alone, for a momentary glimpse of relief, the butcher hates the world a little less. The butcher hates the world except for his daughter, and his daughter is to become his world. This is an intensely disturbing conclusion to end on, likely to provoke most viewers who dared to watch to the very end, but to establish this taboo relationship between father and daughter is to suggest that the butcher's anti-natalist perspective has dissolved. How can living be a selfish act if the act of living can bring joy to another being? Within I Stand Alone, this message is mired by a taboo relationship, but the message also transcends Noah's unsettling narrative, suggesting that living selflessly to bring a joy or hope to others is to make life meaningful. For a film to capture such authentic misanthropy and hatred, there's a peculiar reassurance amidst the murk that suggests a sense of askew hopefulness. In conclusion, Gaspar Noe's I Stand Alone captures a genuine sense of misanthropic loathing, agony and hatred within the ugliest folds of a poverty-stricken, destitute world. A violent and sexually explicit film, through the discomfort and defensiveness of I Stand Alone, there is a suggestion of light at the end of the tunnel, to stand against the world and keep one's head held high. Even if this slight optimism comes in the form of further transgressive behaviour, the solace the butcher experiences within the taboo relationship with his mute daughter, a manipulation of a vulnerable person. The film's message of hopefulness through the murk transcends I Stand Alone's disturbing content. Outside of this film's distressing nature, when the going gets tough, the tough gets going.